you very much, uh, Kevin Corla. Uh, last week I published the report of the scoping inquiry into the cervical check programme, and today I welcome the opportunity to speak about the issues at its very core. I also want to again acknowledge on the record of this House the extraordinary contribution of Vicky Phelan, as well as Stephen Teep and Lorraine Walsh, and the other women and families impacted by the cervical check audit. Dr Scully is clear that this crisis happened because of a failed attempt to disclose the results of a retrospective audit to women who had developed cervical cancer. There was significant public disquiet when it became clear that women themselves were not told about reviews of their own past screening history. The failure to disclose was absolutely wrong, and I recognise the severe and real distress it caused to women and their families. As is often the case with complex issues, some of the complexity was not reflected in the public discourse. I think it's fair to say that there were people who believed women had not been told they had cancer. Indeed, that assertion was made in this House. And people who believed that a diagnosis of cervical cancer in a woman who had been screened as negative was automatically negligent. Thanks to Dr Scally's report, there is a greater understanding now of the complexities involved. He has provided welcome reassurance on the quality of cervical check laboratories. He has found no evidence of any cover-up, his own words. And most importantly, he has crystallised what this is about. It is about women and their families who did not get the information they should have gotten and the devastating impact that it had on them. It is about unreservedly recognising that people have a right to their own medical information. It's about ensuring that our systems work and acknowledging that they completely didn't work in this case. And it's about the impact of this disease at a human level and the need to do all we can to prevent it. And in fact, that collectively, we should endeavour to effectively eradicate cervical cancer. The report is the culmination of intensive work by Dr Scally and his team, done quickly and under intense scrutiny, for which I want to thank him sincerely. It is robust, it is comprehensive, and it will help ensure that women can trust that our cervical screening programme is safe, effective and patient-centred. I want to particularly extend my gratitude to the women and families who engaged with Dr Scally. I do not underestimate how difficult this must have been. I thank them for their courage and their commitment in ensuring that our cervical screening programme has improved. And I was struck by that comment that was said to me by so many times by so many of the women who had been impacted, that the one thing they wanted to come out of this was a better screening programme that lessons would be learned and that they were doing it for their daughters, they were doing it for their granddaughters, they were doing it for their sisters to make sure we have a screening programme that is robust and save lives. And their generosity and how they engaged um, is something that we should all be extremely grateful for. Dr Scully's report sets out the enormous impact this situation has had on those affected. Through my own interactions with them, I have gained some sense of the distress and the pain that has been caused. And Dr Scally has made a number of key recommendations in relation to disclosure, which I intend to implement in full. I intend as a priority to establish a new independent patient safety council that will, as its first task, carry out a detailed review of the existing policy and open disclosure. The resulting policy will have legislative underpinning and will operate right across our health service. The establishment of a statutory duty of candour is a further key requirement. The Patient Safety Bill is scheduled to undergo pre-legislative scrutiny on the 26th of September, and I asked deputies on all sides of the House that they, that they would prioritise the scrutiny of this vital legislation, because it provides a legislative framework for a number of important patient safety issues, including mandatory open disclosure of serious patient safety incidences. While these are key steps, though, disclosure is also about core values, values such as openness and honesty and trust and confidence in doctors. This report presents a challenge to the medical profession, but I believe that the vast majority of doctors and the profession in general hold these values very dear to the care that they provide. I also believe that the dedication and commitment of the entire range of health professions, including doctors, is one of the key assets of our health service. And I want to see constructive engagement on the part of the medical profession with these issues. There were failings on behalf of their profession, and they must be addressed by them. I want to be clear that the government is committed to the continuation of cervical check, as well as breast check and bowel screen. We know that screening saves lives, and Dr Scally has emphasised this. Crucially, Dr Scally found no reason why the existing contracts for the laboratory services should not continue until the new HPV regime is introduced. He is satisfied with the quality management processes in the labs, contrary to some information put on this house by others in the past, and the report presents no evidence that the rates of discordant smear reporting or the performance of the programme fell below what is expected. Indeed, he emphasises the very substantial contribution that Cervical Check have made to women's health over 10 years of the programme. And I know that's been acknowledged by Deputy Kelly and others uh, 
uh, in this House. A woman's lifetime risk of developing cervical cancer has substantially reduced since the inception of the screening programme, from a 1 in 96 uh, chance in 2007 to 1 in 135 in 2015. Dr Scally also considers that the work which has been carried out by the staff in the programme to keep the screening service operating in the middle of what was a very intense controversy is worthy of recognition. I want to thank those staff for that as well. I do not downplay in any way the very serious gaps that have been identified in the governance structures of our screening services. But I want to emphasise that Dr Scally has stated in unequivocal terms that he found no evidence of conspiracy, corruption or cover-up. His words. This speaks to the integrity of our public and civil servants. Some of the things that were said in the heat of this controversy questions the integrity of some of those very public servants in leadership positions. And I do think, after an independent report makes a finding on that, it is important that we acknowledge the actual position on the record of this House, as outlined by the independent experts that we, as an Oireachtas, put in place to establish the facts. The report examines the provision of briefing notes on screening audit and disclosure to my department in 2016. These came into the public domain in May, and I welcome the clarity provided. The inquiry considers that it would have been unreasonable to expect senior management in the HSE, or even more so departmental officials, to have intervened on foot of these notes. That is a finding of the inquiry. The subsequent problems were significantly associated with the failure to disclose, the report says, and it would have been difficult to predict this given the reassurance which the briefing notes provided. We have limited time, so I will not quote from the report, but they are there in the relevant sections. Dr Scally has based his findings on careful examination of contempor contemporaneous records. In fact, he's had more than, I think, 12,800 records. I fully accept Dr Scally's conclusion in this regard, and it is clear that my officials and my department acted entirely appropriately. Dr Scally has been clear that the problems he has uncovered are, um, are systematic and relevant to a whole system failure. And I believe a whole system failure requires a whole system response. I've already taken steps to re-establish a board for the HSE, indeed appointing a chair designate yesterday. This provides the foundation for proper governance and accountability. I intend to bring the Health Service Executive Governance Bill 2018 through the Houses in this session, with a view to establishing the board this year. A priority issue for the new board will and must be to develop and implement an effective performance management and accountability system in the HSE. We know that screening alone is not enough to prevent all cervical cancers, but a well-organised screening programme, when combined with HPV vaccination for boys and girls, can bring us very close to eliminating this disease. That is the government's goal. I believe it is the Oireachtas' goal. I don't intend to play party politics with this. This is something supported by politicians and all political parties in this House, and now we need to get on to do it. We have a vaccination that can save lives. It can prevent girls getting cancer. It can prevent girls dying from cancer. We need to all unequivocally support that. And I'm very pleased that the House supported Deputy Kelly's motion in that regard. We need to extend it to boys uh, as well once we receive the HICWA HTA in the coming days. We should look to extend it next year. I've already given approval for a switch to HPV testing as the primary cervical screening test and work is underway to progress this change. This is vital. We know that 1,000 women will be screened, 20 will have precancerous cells. Screening today will pick up 15 of those 20. When we move to HPV, it will pick up 18 of those 20. So there will still be limitations to screening, and sadly there's always limitations to screening. But we can have an even more accurate system, and indeed be leading the way, along with a small number of other countries, as we move to HPV testing. I want to be very clear, the government accepts all 50 recommendations in this report in full, and I expect to return to government within three months with a full implementation plan. In June, I established the Cervical Check Steering Committee, chaired by the Chief Medical Officer and the Assistant Secretary of Acute Care in my department. The committee crucially includes representatives of the affected women and their families, and I want to thank them for their generous and constructive contribution to that. This is a committee that meets weekly. We publish its minutes, its agendas, uh, and its weekly report on my department's website. It will oversee and direct the implementation of all 50 recommendations, and my department has already established a working group to drive the work of those recommendations. I've already written to each of the organisations mentioned in the report in relation to preparations for implementation, and I've also, through the Chief Medical Officer, commenced engagement with the leadership of the medical profession. I think that's very important. An initial meeting took place earlier today, and I intend to meet with them, with them myself very shortly, along with the Medical Council. But the first step I wish to take, which is the most appropriate, I think, is to meet patients and their families. And I look forward to that happening next week, and then engaging with opposition on what needs further inquiry and what's the best modality to do that. I said I don't believe we should make knee-jerk decisions in relation to that. I want to try and reach a consensus in this House uh, 
but most importantly with the patients affected as well as to how best to move forward. Dr Scali had reached a view in relation to a commission of investigation and we should consider that and explore it together uh, over the next number of weeks. The government's priority is equally with women and families and ensuring that our cervical screening programme is as good as it can be. Dr Scali has given us a framework to fix the very many flaws he identified. My focus, our focus, must now be on implementation, implementation, implementation. If we want to learn the lessons, if we want to fulfil Vicky Phelan's request that, we that some good comes from this awful, awful tragedy, we need to deliver on these recommendations. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you to make that a reality. Thank you, Minister.